Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, I'd especially like to thank our uh, panelists for being here. I'm here, joined here today with the guest editor uh, for this year's volume, Ben Katchor, as well as four of our contributors, uh, Josh Bayer, Gabrielle Bell, Kim Deitch, and Ali Valley. Um, and I'm uh, really grateful to uh, Hodenlof and Harcourt for um, uh, setting up this event and for the strand, to the Strand for hosting us. Um, so what I'd like to do is just talk for a few minutes about the Best American Comics uh, series and this volume, and then I'd just like to talk a little bit to Ben and then the four contributors who we have here, um, a little bit about the work that they have in the volume and a little bit more broadly about their work in general. Um, for uh, those of you who don't know, the Best American Comics is an annual anthology series published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, and it's one of several titles uh, in the Best American line of annual anthology series, uh, which sounds kind of confusing. I'm trying to uh, not use redundant language. It's, hard. it's one series among many series in a series. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the Best American series, plural, from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt um, are a line of annual books, like Best American Short Stories, Best American uh, Science Fiction, Best American Essays, et cetera. Um, the Best American Short Stories uh, actually started in 1915. It's the longest running annual series in this uh, meta series. Uh, Best American Comics started in 2006. Um, so in a way, right there, you kind of have a capsule history of uh, uh, comics uh, rise to uh, the status of literature in the 21st century after nearly 100 years of uh, appreciation of prose literature. Um, anyway, uh, the way all of these ser annual series work is kind of similar. My role is that I'm the series editor for Best American Comics. Um, I'm someone who works on the title for multiple volumes. I've been working on the book, not since its inception, but since the 2014 uh, edition. Um, and my role every year is to collect as much of everything as possible, which is impossible. Um, but one of the nice things about Best American Comics and all of the other Best American titles is that we have an open submissions policy. There is a, a public postal address that anyone can send their comic to. And it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a Xeroxed, uh, hand-folded, hand-stapled uh, zine, or if it's a graphic novel from a large publisher, or anything in between. And of course, you know, uh, we accept, uh, you know, link many, we receive and accept links and PDFs to many comics also uh, that only exist online. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, some of the comics in this year's volume uh, only existed online uh, before we printed them, uh, as I remember, and that's certainly true every year. Um, anyway, in addition to receiving um, a huge quantity of comics through this open call, of course, I also um, keep my radar uh, at high alert all year because I'm aware and I think anyone in any in this type of position would be aware that the things that come through an open call aren't necessarily is doesn't necessarily represent everything, and that there might be a work of interest that doesn't show up automatically in the mailbox. Um, so I also spend a lot of time looking in bookstores, including the Strand, uh, and and a lot of other uh, shops. Um, like Forbidden Planet, just next door, uh, and, and many other places. Uh, I go to comics festivals, particularly small press comics festivals, where one is much more likely to see uh, small press, self-published, and other independent work uh, that doesn't have distribution through bookstores or other established channels. I'm on the internet quite a bit, looking around to see what work people are publishing or self-publishing, work from very small uh, independent presses, and regularly emailing people and ask them to send me their work, et cetera. Uh, in addition, of course, I ask around to colleagues and trusted friends if you know they've seen anything interesting that um, uh, we should know about. Um, so in the end, I amass uh, an incredible quantity of comics. Now, every year uh, for all of these series, the person who's in the series editor role works with a special guest editor who is the guest editor for 
one year's volume only. Um, so in my role in 2014, I worked with Scott McCloud, in 2015 with Jonathan Lethem, in 2016 with Roz Chast, and this past year with Ben Ketcher, who's with us today. So I, I, I look at and read the, you know, many, many, many hundreds of comics in many forms, and then I boil it down to uh, approximately 120 pieces uh, that I send to each year's guest editor over the course of several shipments. Uh, and then the guest editor, who also has the latitude to bring in some work that they've discovered on their own, makes the final choices as to what is going to go into the book every year. This is a picture of Ben in his office uh, being, you know, really decisive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, that, I'm just kidding. That wasn't actually Ben choosing things, although I like to imagine that that's how it is. Um, I'm, I'm sure you might, too. That's actually when we were in his office figuring out the sequence for what order the pieces should go into the book. But nevertheless, I imagine it was something like that. Um, anyway, um, so... What we end up with is um, uh, a book that uh, represents both the work of the past year, but that also represents the um, sensibility of an individual guest editor. Um, so this past year's book, in a way, is a snapshot of the past year's comics, uh, but it's also, uh, I think, you know, to some extent, um, an expression of the point of view of the guest editor that we have every year. Um, and I think uh, one of the values of having someone in that rotating guest editor role every year is that it underlines and makes a strength out of the um, undeniable subjectivity of a process like this. Um, you know, when you call a book or a project the best of anything, you're essentially inviting people to disagree with you. It's like painting uh, a bullseye on your forehead to say, this book that we put together are the best comics of the year. It's like everyone is going to have an alternate opinion on that. Um, so I think what, what the book says is, yes, of course, there's something subjective about assembling uh, a, a group of works and calling it the best, but we're going to make a strength out of that subjectivity and bring a different subjective point of view into the process every year. Um, so anyway, that's just a kind of brief uh, summary of the work that we do every year and that Ben was involved with this past year in his role. Um, ben, one thing I wanted to ask you about this year's volume um, that's, I think, somewhat particular to this year's volume is uh, I know, like for me every year, I'm, I feel very lucky that I get to work very closely with all of the different guest editors uh, who come into the project. Uh, I'm really grateful because um, having to engage another person's point of view and, and see you know, how it different, differs from your own and you know, hearing about the concerns that they have or the questions that they have or the interests that they have uh, that are, in some cases, things that I couldn't have anticipated, it's great for me. I mean, it's very enriching. It broadens my perspective. And in the process, I think, broadens the book quite a bit too. Um, working with you, Ben, one of the things that I really um, appreciated is that I got the sense from the beginning that you really wanted to look beyond what we might think of as you know, the comics field or the comics community or the kind of you know, typical comics sphere. I mean, you were interested, you were asking questions about, for example, like, how do we know if someone isn't making like a great comic in prison somewhere? You know, I mean, you're and and you were thinking of other things, student work, amateur work, uh, et cetera. And actually, what you ended up finding, which is really unique to this year's volume, is work by um, artists working in art centers for adults with um, mental disabilities who are making comics that many people in the comics world had never seen and probably won't see until they see it in this book. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you, um, coming into this project. Um, why it was important to you to look beyond what we might normally think of as the world of comics or the comics uh, community or the oh, comics field. Yeah, well, the kind of comics I like are, in a way, outsider art. They're not main, the, the uh, norm of comics. Oh, sorry. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah, they're... they're um, there are amazing things. I mean, everybody since the... I don't know, uh, has been looking at outsider art, people on the fringes of all these cultures. Uh, 
So it exists in comics too. The mm -hmm. people, you know, with um, with various, uh, I don't know, various. Um, oh, yeah, they're prob they're people with all. Is this mic on, or am I not speaking right now? Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a. Um, there are a lot of people. You know, it's a popular art form. So people grow up looking at these things, and then they, uh, when they're given paper, whether they're in a prison or in a workshop, you know, for adults, um, there's this um, workshop in the in the twenties. Uh, what was? Do you remember the name of that? Um, Is it Pure Vision? Yeah, arts? Pure Vision. Mm -hmm. It's a place where people come with the various. Uh, degrees of autism and they make amazing pictures and some of them make comics or text image work so uh, I, w I mean that's I was just trying to find work that um, excited me and I mean I've been looking at comics for so many years I'm probably the most jaded viewer of comics so it has to be pretty strange to even make me want to look at it <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so I mean that happened in European culture. I don't know, in the 20s people discovered outsider art, art of work from people in insane asylums, people in, uh, you know, um, foreign ethnicities, a cult of tribal art, all that stuff. So I want to find that now. I mean, it exists. They're not institutionalized in the same way uh, in um, mental hospitals now, they're medicated and sent out. So there's not much, it's more in these outpatient places where they're making art. But in prison, they, people who are in for long-term uh, sentences have, art, some prison systems have art programs and they make uh, pictures. They use it as a currency. To, trade for cigarettes and things, making pictures. Of. I, I saw a lot of that. Um, I didn't have time. I, the year went by, but before I could track down all of the programs and figure out if they were minors, they couldn't appear in the book with their name. There were all kinds of problems using some of this work, but um, I stopped looking at a certain point. The deadline came and I gave up. Uh, but someone should keep looking because uh, it's definitely being made. So we're currently out of prison, but but you know we could. I always feel I you know we're all a step away from those people. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, no, I think um, I, what I really appreciate about that is that it really felt like. Um, uh, that you you found an area where there's still a lot more work to be done and um really used uh something that could much more easily have been a very rote platform for representing things that people would expect to see in a book like this as a platform actually for discovery i mean you were essentially doing i think original research to try and pull things into this book and i think the book as a result will present even if there's still a lot more work to do present a lot a, an opportunity for discovery for the readers also yeah so, i mean some of the work is I, I mean i discovered this after the fact it's the only thing someone has ever made they're not they haven't been working at this like some of us here for many years they, they made one comic strip and it was really um fascinating to me and it and i said that that's unusual so, mm -hmm. It's not a matter of time or, or uh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So uh, one of the things is it, it's um, oh, well, sorry, this computer's a little off. Um, one of the things that's a little uh, interesting about working on the series too is that um, I always feel like um, it's very strange to. Uh, put so much labor into making a book that kind of has an expiration date written on the title, you know, because, uh, you know, it says Best American Comics 2017, and then once 2018 rolls along, it starts to already feel like it's part of the past or something like that. Um, you know, and on top of that, there is a little time lag built into the series, uh, because in, technically this book covers work that was published or viewed 
between uh, September 2015 and August 2016. So we have these kind of odd parameters that go into constructing the series. Um, and I, I, I um, often try and impress upon people the fact that the book does have a uh, kind of value beyond its status as just an annual, that, the, that it doesn't expire past a certain date. Because I think the book, first of all, in part because it does represent the point of view of you know, the guest editor, which I think has lasting value, but also the work inside of it has lasting value, even beyond its status as something that's part of a, 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 an annual volume. Um, and um, actually, one of the things that I appreciated is the cover uh, by Matthew Thurber, which as I'm sure many of you in the audience will recognize is kind of a pun, a visual pun on uh, George Orwell's 1984. Um, and so in a way, I, I feel like probably even more so than any other cover that we've had for the series, the cover is very much of the moment because it f is a response to you know, Matthew's feeling about you know, politics this past year and how this year starts to feel more like 1984 than 2017. But the fact that um, something that's called 1984 starts to feel relevant again, I think speaks to the fact that um, these works don't have expiration dates, that Orwell's 1984 is in some ways still relevant past 1984, past the fall of the Berlin Wall and all the rest of it. Um, now I wanted to um, ask our panelists about the um, pieces that are in the book. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Kim Deitch. Um, Kim, the work that we have of yours is a story called uh, Shrine of the Monkey God. And this originally ran in um, uh, an anthology called Kramer's Ergot, Volume 9. Um, and this story, as I understand it, is um, a chapter from an upcoming graphic novel. Is that correct? That's right. It, uh -huh. it was the very first thing I did for a, a, a book that I'm working on now called Reincarnation Stories, mm -hmm. which uh, basically it's exploring my various past lives. Okay. But, you know, of course it's a work of fiction. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't really have a firm opinion on reincarnation, but it's great fiction fodder. Uh -huh. You know, and I've been having a great time with it. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm having a hard time stopping working on it. I just keep coming up with new stories. Uh -huh. and, uh, so is the premise of the book that all each chapter is uh, a, a different past life of yours? Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I'm staring up at, at a monkey there. Mm -hmm. who was, you know, there was a, a moment of regression where I got demoted back to animals again. Mm -hmm. and so that's what that particular story is about. But uh, yeah, it all just comes out of feelings I had when I was a kid. I mean, I remember sitting around when I was a kid, when I was about four years old, and I was suddenly having this funny feeling like I could remember. First of all, I, could, I felt like I'd been here forever already at age four. And second of all, I just had this odd feeling of, I used to wear glasses. Mm -hmm. And you know, four years old, I'd never worn glasses. and. You know, I, I, I just always wondered about that. Mm -hmm. And then also, I just kind of came up with, you know, when I heard on the street, you know, about Jesus going to heaven and all of that, I came home and told my parents about it. They just laughed in my face and said, forget it. It's not happening, you know. And, uh, you know, so then I sort of went back to the mental drawing board and came up with the idea of reincarnation on my own, too. And so that kind of makes me made me wonder. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I have no conclusion about it, but you know, I think it's it's a it's it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. but everything mm -hmm. in this book, it's it's fiction. It's just trying to create a good entertainment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, usually, like your fiction has mixed fiction and reality. Like here, you have yourself as a uh, as a character in this book, right? Well, that... yeah, I I mean, I'm in it a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. I sure did go to the Museum of Natural History when I was about seven years old. And, so and that's a picture of, this is the actual oh, and, thing and that, that you're looking at? Thing we're look, yeah, yeah, that's what really got me going. I, my wife Pam and me, we went to the museum some years ago, and I was looking at all the old dioramas, and that one just, I thought, this is incredible. They've slaughtered this entire community of monkeys to make their lousy diorama, you know, although it's a very interesting and all that. But, you know, and I, 
I just kind of couldn't get over that. I kept thinking about that particular diorama, and the first thing you know, I was going over to the Museum of Natural History and making a lot of sketches of it and mm -hmm. kind of recreating, recreating it as not as accurately as pretty accurate, but you know, I was kind of anthropomorphizing it a little bit, but. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, there's just something so timeless about the Museum of Natural History and those dioramas. I mean, they're just exactly the same as they were when I was even six years old and being dragged through it as a kid before mm -hmm. they took you there mm -hmm. on that annual pilgrimage mm -hmm. in public schools. Um, so the story you spun out of this is, um, like, what, what is the premise of the Shrine of the Monkey God piece? Well, it's, uh, I'm standing there looking at it, and this guy next to me, he's starting to recall all these different monkeys mm -hmm. and, and pointing them out by name mm -hmm. and uh, kind of looking at me like, you really should understand that, shouldn't you? Because after all, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, he seems to realize that, you know, I should know more about this than I really do. And uh -huh. then he starts to tell me the story, uh -huh. the long, sad story of yeah. how this particular diorama came to pass. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it was sort of like the height of his life mm -hmm. because he's this shrimpy little guy. But then when he he's taken to Africa, he gets adopted by these monkeys and, and really rises in the ranks with them, you know, and is doing just great until his parents come looking for him again and in the process slaughter all of his pals and even this girl monkey he was about to get over on, you know, and, you know, and it's just, so it's sort of a, well, it's not a, it's a tragedy and it's also a little bit of a comedy. Yeah. And it's yeah. just a story that was nudging at me to do, you know, and, uh, knew I'd do it and, and somehow it also seemed to fit in with this vague idea I had about doing a book about reincarnation mm -hmm. which I I've been meaning to do for years although I don't know based on what because I didn't have any particular story together mm -hmm. but it all has sort of magically come together just mm -hmm. each piece as I've needed it along the way you mentioned that you um, were going to the museum and making sketches of this diorama. And I was going through some uh, files and I saw that you had made a presentation previously about your process and work in progress. I don't have images of every phase, um, but I know that you go through a lot of different um, drafts when you're working on a page. Um, well, and since, since we have this image, and I think it might be interesting to people who have no idea how someone makes comics, like how does a page like this relate to like the finished page that we saw uh, a minute ago? Well, what it is is, you know, when I'm writing, I tend to be drawing and designing at the same time. Like when I drew that particular page, I guess I sort of knew where the story was going, but I sure as hell didn't have it written, mm -hmm. you know? and what it seems to happen is, while I'm kind of working it out, I end up with a bigger and bigger pile of rectangular pieces of Xerox paper, which is my version of the sketchbook. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I've got a sufficient number and it seems to be kind of working into a story, then I actually work the scenario out. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the work is like it's more than half done mm -hmm. in terms of writing. It's, I've sort of written it on the sly of myself while designing it's just mm -hmm. it's just a way i've gotten used to working mm -hmm. and, and and you typically work like horizontally and then sort of work out the story and the designs but then at a certain yeah, point yeah i know there's something screwy about that but there's just something about that horizontal piece of xerox paper that seems to set my mind free uh -huh. you know and i've got piles of them at home mm -hmm. that's that's my sketchbook whereas a sketchbook itself i'm holding it in my hand what am i supposed to do with this you know, and the nicer the book, the the less effective it is for me, you know. Just uh -huh. get it out of my way, you know. <laughs> but if it's just one piece of paper, you know, and it's home and no one's looking, yeah. it works out pretty good. It's just something I figured out along the, yeah. along the way, trial and error. You try different things, you know, and see what works. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly I think what, what every artist has in common is they've figured out what works for them. Yeah, you know, you gotta, for what they need you to do. You've got to figure that out. Yeah. So this is going to be part of an, a book that is coming out eventually called Reincarnation Stories. You shared this image with me, which I yeah. guess will be the cover. That's the cover. Uh -huh. And that's like, you know, at the very, 
the very end of the actual book. Yeah, like my cat character Waldo with his girlfriend. She has no lines. She mm -hmm. just comes in at the end of the story, and uh, he jumps out of my window into that thing, and they take off. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, do you have a general idea of when you think the book will be finished? I think you're, you said you were still working on part of it. Yeah, I'm having a good time, and I, I seem to be reluctant to give it up. And so I'm, I'm starting to add stories to the appendix. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be a thing I do. Uh, you know, if something's going good, I don't want to let go of it. But I, in, in defense of that, it's going to be a better book. These stories that I'm doing now, they are germane to the theme of the book. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, It'll be great, I think, you know, just give me a, I don't know, maybe inside of a year. I don't know. I don't even want to, I'm not that concerned about it. But every day I get up and put my hours in, and every week I try to put 40 hours in working on it. Mm -hmm. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, great. Uh -huh. I'm looking forward to that book. Um, it's so funny that Kim was just talking about sketchbooks, because uh, I wanted to talk to Josh uh, about his work. Um, the... Uh, the piece that we ran this year in uh, Best American Comics is a mini comic called 2010. Um, and can you, Josh, can you just sort of tell the backstory of what this piece is? Uh, yeah, this was um, a comic that I discovered in a sketch. What, I turn this off? I'm still on, right? Oh, no, it's on. It's good. <clears throat> I discovered it in a sketchbook and I revisited it actually when I was taking a uh, risograph class, um, the color printing technology course that's taught over at SVA. So I kind of excavated this piece and uh, used it as an excuse to do a black and white piece in color. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, uh, at the time when I was doing the comic, uh, like I said, it was 2010. And um, I think that at the time that was this was my way of being really straightforward, like getting right into this image, this imagery that I could I found really crunchy. You know, it's kind of aggressive and all about uh, kind of cathartic to draw, and that's what um, uh, a lot of artists go through that stage where they just have an anything goes kind of period. Some people put out anthologies like Peter Baggy used to do neat stuff where every he, whatever came to his mind, he would do a short piece. Some of them were sarcastic, some of them were ironic, some of them were more like deep cuts of home life. And um, there's something really freeing about that. So that's where I was at at the time. Uh, I just wanted to improvise and get into, see what it felt like to get into imagery that was uh, kind of, kind of um, uh, yeah, I thought would feel like it was kind of edgy and like, Disgusting in some ways. So this was so this was something for, that you found in your sketchbook from 2010 and sort of re resurrected. Yeah. And did you add anything to it? Yeah, I think I added the first two pages. It's it's hard to remember if, um, which points you guys <laughs> ran. Mm -hmm. I think that this is actually the original page, and then I redrew two pages because I couldn't find them, and so I kind of improvised. And the original two pages were much better. They were both really simple, but the original one was simple in a slightly different way. Uh, and the color was different, and then I actually, oh no, I did add two different things. I added a new cover image, and I added a sort of a, an afterword right. that discussed it and put it in context. Mm -hmm. And whenever you do comic work, you go back, and I mean, I can remember exactly where I was at ten, um, seven years ago when I did that. I can remember both parts of it. The uh, first part with the crazy cat story and the second part with the Nick Cave peeing on a bush story. And that was inspired by, at the time, um, the woman I was dating, she had this nephew who was like really, you know, he's at that, at that stage when kids like have, uh, or don't even know how imaginative they are. So I think we were talking about, I think we're talking about maybe getting him to draw, and I asked him what he would draw if he drew something. And he ended up kind of coming up with a thread of somebody peeing on a bush and somebody else cutting off their head. Mm -hmm. And I, um, he didn't draw it, so I stole it from him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so these are just a few more images uh, from that uh, uh, comic that you printed um, uh, that was originally 
from 2010 and then reworked and then printed uh, during the period that we covered. It's kind of interesting because you mentioned you're using risograph printing technology. And in a way, like that becomes like a layer of art too, in the sense like whatever tech printing technique you use, whatever coloring process you use, it sort of transforms the work in a way, I think. Yeah. Um, adding color has been a big, I think it's going to prove to be an important step for the, the development of my work. Mm -hmm. um, and like some of the people on, I'd say everybody on this panel is a master of black and white um, work. And I think that those narrow confines that comics present to you, that there's a tradition of uh, Will Eisner and, and uh, Harriman and all these other people who did everything just with black and white mm -hmm. depth, separation, um, texture. And I uh, have always gone for that, but I started off with painting. I was all through the 90s, I was doing a lot of um, uh, uh, mix, mixed media painting, collage type of stuff. And when I went back to comics, I've gotten a lot better at controlling my set, controlling what I do and planning it, and um, not just kind of going wild like I did with my painting. But I've never really mastered the separation just using black and white. Um, so I, going back to color, I kind of considered color a crutch, mm -hmm. and it's and maybe it's a. a um, Maybe it has to do with the financial element. I felt like I felt like if I master black and white, I could always produce my reproduce my stuff cheaply. But uh, after all this time, I've discovered that yeah, I really I, I think half of my work was missing not having done color for all this time. There's just something that I just don't understand how to visually put that um, visually um, um, represent without color. Um, and one thing about the story too, you mentioned that it, you know you, you just referred to you know your appreciation of how George Harriman and Eisner and others have used you know black and white really well, and you know you uh, you know this story itself we see here those are Crazy Cat and Ignatz Mouse from the Crazy Cat comic strip, and it's got Little Orphan Annie in it. You've done a lot of other work that includes characters ranging from Nancy to Rom. Like mm. uh, you know, it seems like comics history is really important to you not just is to appreciate it, but also it's something that you feel, it seems like you feel very free to incorporate it into your own work. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe too free. Uh -huh. But the, uh, uh, yeah, actually I think I've started to disguise like influences more. Like in my new book I have, um, I have a character who visually is based on Little Orphan Annie a lot, but it's nobody else would know it but me. The, um, I think it has to do, when I was a kid, my dad had a couple of really thick comics history books around the house. There was a Smithsonian one. I think that's the one that's not very text heavy. It's very cartoon heavy. There's another one, though, that has a similar name. It had a white cover if the, if the dust jacket was missing. It was another 70s or late 60s book. And it had a lot of reprints, but it wasn't as much like you could read a story. As w and there's a lot of essays about every artist. We had that, and I read that from cover to cover. Uh, I read The Great American Comic Book Heroes by Will Eisner. And it's not, of course, like now, where you switch from one different distraction to another. We'd, we, those were the only things we had that were comic related in the house. My dad, like I said, he worked as a librarian at Ohio State University. And when he let me tack along to the office, I knew where in the stacks where they had this tiny comic section. And they also had Skippy by Percy who, Crosby. Thank you. Skippy. I read that book from cover to cover. I read the Eisner, um, I'm sorry, Pfeiffer from cover to cover, the collected works of Pfeiffer. I read the Buck Rogers reprints. So that stuff was. Um, yeah, that stuff was um, something I knew really well really early on. So I've been, I think, the interest in history and the comfort with referring to those things goes pretty deep with me. Mm -hmm. In this case, you've really kind of released something that was uh, very loose in your sketchbook. Um, and you also show uh, tons of images online uh, through you know social media. I follow your stuff online. It seems like you're constantly drawing in almost every drawing you make. You don't mind showing it to people some way, whether it's printed or just on Instagram or whatever. Um, but you do also produce more labor-intensive work. Like you were saying, we ran um, an excerpt from a book called Theth 
in uh, Best American Comics a couple of years ago. And I know you've been working on a, a sequel. Is that the book that you were referring to before with the kind of Little Orphan Annie-esque character? Yeah. That's a, it's just one random page I pulled off of Instagram. And this is a uh, work that's way more certainly um, labored over, I think, than some of the sketch stuff that you put online and probably the stuff in 2010, which seems like it was very just kind of whatever, you put it down and move on to the next panel kind of thing. Whereas here with this work, it seems like you're really like laboring over every panel, making corrections, doing paste downs, you know, using correction fluid, you know, whatever. Um, to you, what is the difference between um, what you might maybe will allow yourself to do in a sketchbook mm -hmm. and what you need to get to in a finished page? Well, 2010 was actually, um, I have a pretty good memory of, fin of working on that. Mm -hmm. And I remember being kind of vexed by um, how much time it took me, though it looks pretty simple. My process is usually, I'll, I'll go over D different, I go from one corner to the another, to the other, to the other, and then I'll look for whichever corners I left out. And I remember, you know, there, I tell my students a lot, there's this book called The War of Art, and um, they talk about how, anybody ever read that book? It's really good for people who um, have, uh, have um, a lot of internal conflicts with finishing work. So they talk about how much pressure there is internally to not finish work for artists, how easy it is to have something which is 97% done or 90% done, and you have a stack of 90% works left all over the place. And I remember when I did that book, it wasn't quite done. There was just think, things I was still trying to map out on the page, and stupid comic, I wouldn't let it go, and I remember it taking, in a way, it took as much time as these do. There was just, I just spend more time with uh, ruling out my borders now. And with the, with the level of um, skill I was at at the time, I think I struggled just as much to make things separate and create texture and depth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes, like, I did a, a page for the new book yesterday that I managed to do it in, I think, four hours, maybe six, but that's pretty fast for me. I wrote it. And usually I write it and I sit on it for a week and then I draw it and then I'll ink it and then the inking might take hours and hours and hours. And I did one just about four hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I want to uh, ask Gabrielle about her work too, if I can get this Thank you. Slide Thanks up. for including me. Go. Oh. Both ears. Thank you Please so much. Please don't thank me on the panel. They can do that at dinner or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll thank you. I'll thank you before, during, uh, and I'll after. I'll thank you now for all of those great comments, which I think are useful to many people right. in the audience. Um, uh, you know, because this is, in a way, it's kind of interesting that with both um, Josh and with Gabrielle's work in the volume this year, um, in a way, I, we're presenting them with, we're presenting them to the audience by showing work that's a little bit looser and rougher uh, than the most polished version of the work. Um, but it is work that both of you have published in the world. So in this case, Gabrielle, what we've run in the volume this past year is uh, some work from your, I guess it's, is it fair to say it's an annual project now, what you call your July diary? Yes, yes. It's uh, been about six years, I think. Now. You've been doing this for six years? I think six years, yes. Mm -hmm. Every July I do a comic strip every day based on my life, so it's called July Diary. But it's more than just a diary, I have to say. It's, um, I mean, I try to make them funny, and I, sometimes they are. Mm -hmm. This is uh, just, a, just a screen grab of your um, website. So every day in the month of July, you just post a totally brand new comics page. Um, yeah, that particular year, I was trying to uh, make it easier on myself or harder in a way by not doing any preliminary sketches or penciling it was all the first line on the page and so on so you're working directly in ink on paper yeah mm -hmm. and uh, i cheated sometimes so but mm -hmm. it um, wasn't easier though <laughs> well i would think it would be harder in some ways because it's a little more nerve-wracking I was trying to take the pressure of my of it off by allowing it to be 
bad or messy or whatever, mm -hmm. but the pressure just piles on. <laughs> well, um, do you uh, do you draw these pages literally each day so that if once every day when someone reads it, it's what you drew basically the day before. Like you don't stockpile or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it was the day of mm -hmm. kind of thing. And does it also, is it a di true diary in the sense that it depicts something that happened that day or do you sometimes go back to things that happened earlier in the month or? Uh... I fudge it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I will tell something that happened in the last week or I'll sew two different things together or, uh, I mean, I try to make it work but generally, it is it, I tend to work be best with material that's kind of fresh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, do you keep uh, a comics diary outside of July ever? I try to. OK. Yes. So that's like a year-round project where you're producing comics in addition to your published work that's just for your own private uh, consumption. Uh, yeah, I try to use it as a sort of, like some of it gets turned into stories and comics, and some of it just goes in this box of bad comics. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you're producing this whole body of, of basically unseen work in addition to the huge I, volume I wouldn't of call it that, because uh -huh. I mean it's more like a diary, it's not work, it's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really repetitive and not interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the diary comics, the July diary anyway, that you publish is seen principally online. You've also done, oops, uh, you've also done some mini comic versions of it and we can see how there are like some color pages where you paste on like garbage pail kids and things like that. Um, uh, do you, how do you feel about reproducing this kind of very rough work? Does it, do you feel like it's, um, people understand that it's specific to the project or do you ever worry that like it's not the most refined drawing that you do but you're publishing it and putting it out in the world yeah I do worry about that and I sort of resist it but then my publisher and people will encourage me and then I'll make some money from it <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then I, I sort of forget I'll give the comic out to people and I'll, for a minute, I'll be like, is that what, are they going to think that that's how all my comics are? Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it kind of just, I just, I can't really uh, think too much about the impression my work is going to make. Mm -hmm. But in, in terms of the content, like the sort of freshness of the kind of just day in the life type of content, do you feel like this work gets a different kind of response uh, from readers than your other work? Possibly a more sympathetic response. Mm -hmm. Like there's some, I've got like just like a handful of really devoted readers <laughs> that I think that are, they really relate. And sometimes they write me these little emails that they just really directly relate to simple things, just mm -hmm. like being a, a little bit agoraphobic or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe it, these do, connect with people on a more personal level mm -hmm. and it's more like uh, um, people know me a bit better <laughs> or a bit more which is kind of strange in its own way mm -hmm. but I accepted it. Mm -hmm. Yeah I guess I can see how because it has that like day in the life quality and also even just the ra sort of relative rawness of the art that it seems so direct that it feels almost like you're more in touch with the person but that's probably also not any more true than it is when you're doing other work is it well other work i'll rework it and i'll do several drafts and i'll polish it and i'll add some humor there and there's some pathos there and <laughs> It's a little bit more of like a magic trick or something. Uh -huh. And like the honesty or the truth of it hopefully doesn't get too lost, but it's definitely, um, I'm looking for the effect mm -hmm. like the, or like the, the reading experience. Whereas these, I'm kind of 
laying my soul bare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's always a bit of a ten tension between how much of myself I'm going to expose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like h how far I'll go before it gets creepy or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because there's at some point where people really relate, and then I'm sure there's some point in which they're like, mm, she's just weird. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to show some images from uh, your most recent book, uh, Everything is Flammable. Um, and I think this probably represents more what you were talking about in terms of taking things from real life, but then giving it some structure, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm looking. I mean, there's just like, I'm thinking about the where the story's going and throwing in punchlines and stuff. Mm -hmm. For people who don't know about the book, can you just briefly explain what this book is? Because I think this is a straightforwardly autobiographical book, right? Yeah. It's, um, I was actually doing the July Diary when it happened, but my, um, my mother, who lives out in the country and off the grid, sort of, uh, her house and her car burned down. Everything she owned, all of her life savings, because her money was like under her mattress. <laughs> so she lost everything, and um, and I was just doing my Jul July diary. So I um, flew out there and helped her and to uh, you know get a new life started. So the book is sort of about getting her life together, getting a trailer and then getting a new cabin and um, but it's also about our relationship and about the community and what happens when somebody's life falls apart and so that's that's the story. Mm -hmm. um, and I know when you started making comics you um, were you know doing well I think when I think of your work I think I tend to think of you as an artist who works in black and white, but I think this is maybe like the second book you've done that's pretty much, this is full, a full color book. And I think uh, the two before that actually were in full color. I don't, was it two or three um, recent books that were in full color? I had another book, The Voyeurs, which was full uh -huh. color. And then. Um, was Truth is Fragmentary in color? Truth is Fragmentary is mostly the. It's partial? Diary color? comics. It's got a few color okay. pages. Um, but, I've worked with color off and on. Okay. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering what you thought about color since Josh was talking about it before as, you know, on the one hand sort of striving to make everything function in black and white as well as the kind of econ economy of black and white, uh, but then also what color can add to it. How do you feel it's functioned in your work? Do you l prefer working in color or black and white or is it just different depending on the story? Well, I guess you could say it's kind of like a crutch, but I think comics are... They can be challenging, and a crutch is good. <laughs> I mean, um, I uh, I think my comics can be confusing. The black and white. If you look at the black and white ones, you, your eye has to sort of work to see the figures and distinguish them from the background. And the color kind of directs your eye where to look. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I find that people find that much easier. Mm -hmm. And I find that much more easy easy for the reading experience like you don't have to you don't get distracted trying to figure out what everything is mm -hmm. um i mean it's a subtle thing and it's probably a bit subconscious but um i love color <laughs> like the only time i the only reason i wouldn't do color is because it just takes so long to do the the story and the inking and all of it then the color, it'll just take a whole nother day. Mm -hmm. And then good coloring is going to take even, like, I wish I had time to go over all that and just do, like, really, like, do light and shadow and, like, more dramatic things. But um, it takes so much time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to move on to the next page, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I don't have an image of it, but Ben, actually, you are someone who's worked, I think, for... Uh, a lot of the work of yours that people know, and I think most of the books of yours I have on my shelf are, you know, pen and ink with gray wash. And lately, you've been working in full color for uh, Metropolis magazine. Um, was that something that you had to sort of teach yourself how to do, or was that um, something that you did because the magazine wanted it, or had you always no, wanted I, to work in I, color? 
Um, yeah, the newspapers I appeared in didn't have color uh, cap printing capabilities, so it had to be on black and white. It was no, and uh, um, no, I always like to do water. I do them with watercolor, so I always like to use watercolor. Uh, you still do watercolor? Uh, no, I I now usually color things digitally, but. Um, Sometimes I output a digital line drawing and do watercolor over it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, no, it doesn't take me much longer. I work pretty quickly, mm -hmm. so it's not a time. Mm -hmm. No, it's um, no. I like to do those strips in color. Mm -hmm. It's a whole other layer of drama in mm -hmm. color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you figure out. Um, yeah, it's part of the story delusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, it was weird. Some pe a couple of um, strips that were I wanted to put in this book were these very crude uh, risographs, and when they delivered the the strip for printing, they like redid it in Photoshop, a very slick version of it. And I well, that was Josh. You would you would you I think want, wanted to yeah, you had a something. different Yours color version. Is that quite as the other one was just I mean it was this complete fog of texture that I thought was amazing and without that the strip was nothing I mean it was it was w really strange somebody would ruin their strip thinking it was a uh, I mean so I think we told him if you don't let us run the original we won't run it at all no, we but, didn't yeah. say that but um <laughs> <laughs> we um well it never came we shared your point of view but um no, well, I think it was interesting, though, uh, because there were a couple of pieces in the book, Ben, that you wanted really to run as almost like reproductions of the like printed similes, object like similes, in, the, yeah. in the book. Right. And that's definitely a tension working on a series like this, because the work that comes to us comes to us in so many different formats. We get graphic novels, things from the web, things that are silk screens, things that are risographed, things that are, you know, photocopied, et cetera. And, you know, sometimes on printed on different colored paper, you know, I mean, they have all these textures and forms. And then we sort of, uh, almost put it through a blender and, and, and package it up in this very kind yeah. of conventionally formatted book where every page is the Terrible same Terrible thing, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, I think, Ben, you were very conscious and sensitive to wanting yeah. to give the reader something of the experience. Well, facsimile, you just mm -hmm. uh, scan the original and try to uh, reproduce it. So at least optically, it looks like the thing. It's not mm -hmm. the same texture. It's not the same paper. Mm -hmm. no. But, uh, but uh, yeah, no, some of these strips is purely the texture I liked. Mm -hmm. I didn't even want to read them sometimes. I just love to look at these things. I said, well, he, he read this is an amazing oh. thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, but I want to make sure we have enough time to speak uh, with uh, Ellie, too. Ellie, uh, I, this kind of goes back a little bit to the... Um, maybe the, the time capsule quality of the book that I was talking about uh, at, at the beginning. But um, this, you know, we have, we have a few pieces in the book that, you know, refer maybe obliquely to uh, the political moment, but this was the most directly uh, political or, or uh, timely piece that we have in the book. This is a comic called Schlonged. Uh, can you, first of all, let, tell people where this first ran? Hello? Yeah. Um, yeah, it ran in Daily Dot, which okay. is an online publication. Okay. Yeah. And um, this, so this is the one piece that we have in the book that, you know, among other qualities that it has, directly depicts, uh, you know, public figures, in particular Donald Trump. And I would like to put up, you know, just for the duration, uh, this full page image uh, that we have in the book. Um, so, can, but you wrote um, one of the things that we have in the volume are statements by all of the contributors, and you, I, I found your statement actually really fascinating because I would have assumed reading this piece, and when I read it, we can maybe take that off the screen now. Um, when I read this piece, that you would have done it at a much later moment in the campaign season than you actually drew it. Can you talk a little bit about that con? What the well, first of all, what the piece is about, and then the context for it? Yeah, I mean, by the way, thank you for. Uh, printing it um, in general, but also non-bodlerized, you know, you actually, you have curse words and penal, um, yeah. you know, 
art. Yeah. Um, That's why Diamond, the distributor to comic book store, has listed it in the adult catalog with pornography. Really? Yeah. yeah. They do that sometimes whenever there's like an image of a sex act or a male genitalia or something like that. They put us in with like, uh, you know, pornography Mm. in the the separate adult Mm. catalog. I hope it doesn't hurt sales or (laughs) maybe whatever. But anyway. Um, Okay, so actually, I don't remember. Was it January? Uh, it was in 2016, early 2016, six weeks before Trump actually boasted about his penis on uh, at a at a national debate. Debate. Um, so at the time, you know, we 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 were in this like crumbling um, electoral process, and I didn't think he would win, but I did think that he um, that his uh, campaign revealed a lot about obviously his base, but where we were as a country, and uh, it, I was just trying to go further than where where he was and it was very hard because he kept um he kept eclipsing satire you know you, you couldn't go further you, you couldn't invent hyperbole and it's still the case today which is why i think this comic is just like it is a time capsule because you know the only thing he hasn't done is disrobe on live tv but i don't want to say that because he's probably doing it right now i'm not online <laughs> but you know we might find out afterwards um so i was uh trying to get to the subtext uh, of all of his uh braggadocio and um uh, you know, making America gray, that, you know, both uh, the white supremacy and the um, male toxicity, those were like the two interlinked um, qualities of his campaign and his persona. And um, I tried to capture that um, by, you know, revealing the um, subtext as text, you know, mm-hmm. the subtext was, I have a big dick. And, um, and then, you know, later in the campaign, the locker room stuff, you know, I mean, how they, how they explain, you know, boasts of sexual um, assault as locker room talk, you know. Um, so, so I was trying to go further and, um, and also getting into the psychopathology of Donald Trump. And, um, but then I think six or seven weeks after the comic came out, he did the whole, the, the boast. And so it, um, you mean when he was talking about the size of his hands and there's no problem there. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. Literally. Yeah. yeah. I think cause Marco Rubio had been advised to go after him for, you know, the same things that I did and, um, didn't really work, uh, uh, in for Mar- Marco Rubio's campaign, for whatever reason, he didn't he didn't have his authenticity or whatever. Um, but when he did it in the um, debate, uh, Donald Trump responded by saying, "There's no problem with his uh, penis, basically, mm-hmm. literally." Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just yeah, he he eclipsed it once again. Mm-hmm. So you you were trying to basically think like what's the line that he won't cross, and then just yeah. like a few weeks yeah. later, kind of went there. Exactly. I, I was yeah. trying to think, you know. Uh, he, he crosses every line. He, he he abolishes every kind of standard of decorum and also institutions. And um, so I was like, well, I need to do something that's, that's hyperbolic, but how can you do hyperbole when it's a, a buffoon, mm-hmm. you know? And at the time, I should reiterate, I did not think he would be elected. I thought he just revealed something about our, our body politic. Mm-hmm. Um, so I figured, okay, dick, that, that he, he's not going to go there. Mm-hmm. But I was wrong. Now, just can you put this in a little bit of context? Do you, um, my understanding is that you pretty regularly produce both single panel images and comics pages that are broadly about politics, maybe more specifically about a few particular political issues. But can you just, right. for people who maybe haven't seen your work, just explain like where this fits into the kind of work you're normally doing? I mean, um, for the pro- uh, previous 10 years, I've been um, drawing largely on Israel-Palestine and American-Jewish relationship to Israel. Um, via, you know, my style, which is grotesquery. So this gave me an opportunity to apply grotesquery to the Gentile world, which was very liberating. Um, and so any claims that, you know, my, my depictions of uh, Jewish communal leaders are anti-Semitic, uh, you can look at my Trump and, uh, you know, the grotesquery is pretty evenly distributed. Um, and you actually have, a, I think, a brand new book. Is this out yeah. now? Yeah, it's out now. Uh-huh. This is uh, Diaspora Boy, and this is, could, I guess, a collection of your comics and cartoons yeah. with some essays from yeah. last, I don't know what the time period Ten years. is. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Diaspora Boy is from a comic I did called Israel Man and Diaspora Boy, satirizing Zionist conceptions of diaspora. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of um, the book, the compendium, and the way it's introduced and the way it's bound together, the vertebrae behind it is... Um, talking about how um, we, you know, self-hatred in the diaspora is something that's been manufactured in Zion and we wear it throughout the world. And basically it's time to uh, redefine Jewish authenticity as that which we actually practice, which is, at least in America, um, progressive, left-wing, and largely secular. And we've been told for decades now that that is, the, that is self-hatred. And my book is, you know, through satire, 
it's saying no, um, that's actually insulting and that's actually anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's kind of this year, I think it's kind of interesting that this is comics on crisis in America and Israel because it seems like you had some images, I just wanted to show one of them because I thought that it was so funny. Uh, you have quotes from critics of yours who you've caricatured uh, yeah. where it's, you know, the reviews are as if this is like a plug for your book, but it's yeah, yeah. like sort of the most vicious comments, I guess, that people have made about you. Yeah. I mean, I often satirize the way um, right wing Zionists uh, attack um, you know, secular or non Likud diaspora Jews. Mm -hmm. And, but then whenever I satirize them, then they attack me for that. And it's like, this wonderful circle. It's like they, 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 they always take the bait. So Eli Lake is one of these, um, people who has criticized me repeatedly in the past. And so we use one of his quotes for a blurb. Um, and I did this for a bunch of them, uh, including mm -hmm. Alan Dershowitz and John Podhortz. And, um, and so he just went apeshit on Twitter when this came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's like I, I can't even keep up with them. And, you know, I can make more blurbs based on the stuff that he was uh, attacking me for mm -hmm. based on this. OK. So. And you so on the one hand, you're kind of being critiqued as a sort of, uh, I guess, like a self-hating anti-Semite because you don't um, you're not you're making uh, cartoons that are critical of what you see as um, conventional positions at the same time you're also making, uh, continuing to make cartoons about domestic politics too, um, where it's kind of this weird thing where the, um, your critics are basically conservative yeah. and who are now in league with sort of straight up kind of often anti-Semites or white right. supremacists right. or something that's, like that's that. That's the um, hallucinatory, topsy-turvy world we're in right now. Right. I mean, some of my critics are never Trumpers, but even, even the never Trumpers among my critics, you know, among those, of that ilk on the spectrum um, spent the past uh, decade or two decades, or let's say one decade, uh, normalizing the same kind of bigotry and demagoguery that we're seeing now mm -hmm. in the form of Netanyahu in Israel. Mm -hmm. And so they um, helped lay the groundwork for the nightmare we're curr currently experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of nighttime experiences, I noticed that you had one more recent Trump image that sort of reminded me a little bit of the big one that we had in Best American Comics. Can you just explain what oh, this one is? Um, yeah, it's interesting because the one in this volume, it was like my, one of my first drawings of Trump, and so it's much more constrained, I think, despite yeah. the penis. Uh, here, uh, it's evolved a bit to be, have this like um, mulish mouth and all that. Um, this one is basically his wet dream of, a, of an ISIS attack, which allows him to um, uh, you know, expand the travel ban, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? go ahead with the wall, national curfew, um, and nationalizing national mon monuments and park parks. And then at the end, you know, it's, you read it like that. But, and it was at this moment that Mr. Trump finally became president because that's what they keep saying every time there's some perceived pivot, mm -hmm. which is never a pivot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I remember uh, reading years ago a little book that I think I found here at the Strand that was like a, um, just a little tiny hardcover book that was just basically an essay that was like bound up as, as a book. That was um, Henry James writing about Daumier. And uh, it was, you know, it, it's kind of influenced my thinking a little bit about political art because he was basically trying to a ask the question, ask and answer the question, you know, how does um, political art uh, remain relevant or powerful as art beyond the political moment? that it's addressing maybe past the point where you can even necessarily recognize all of the figures uh, who are in the art, you know, because now we can look at like images by uh, James Gilray or something like that from the 18th century and nobody knows who most, I mean, not, I shouldn't say nobody, but nobody who's not like a historian would be able to tell you, you know, this allegory of, you know, the crisis over, I don't know, the silver standard or whatever, you know, whatever, uh, how to, how to explain it. Do you, what do you think about those kinds of things? Is that something that concerns you in terms of making art that is going to have a uh, shelf life or are you more committed to just kind of the praxis of engaging the political moment? The latter. Okay. Um, but, but I, I do different kinds of comics. Um, mm -hmm. so clearly like with the single panel ones or mm -hmm. even with this, um, you know, multi-page one, um, it's uh, a reaction to uh, the current moment. And, um, you know, it just so happens that we are in sort of a cataclysmic period in American history mm -hmm. and this moment will never be forgotten, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's possible that um, doing comics maybe during the first Clinton 
you know, Bill Clinton's administration um, would have been a little bit less, um, maybe long, long lasting, mm -hmm. um, although it would for its own reasons, but mm -hmm. you, you need to get in the weeds. Right now we're, we're living in a circus and, um, but, but also a period of enormous degradation Mm -hmm. um, in this, in the transformations we're experiencing and mm -hmm. we'll be, we'll be, um, living with the results of that for decades. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but you're right. I mean, in terms of, um, not shelf life, but, um, like references and things mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. it's the nature of the game when it, when it's political, uh, satire based on current events that, um, you know, it's the window of, you know, total comprehension, um, gets smaller, um, every mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, for you know particular comics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay um i hope we have a little bit of time left for people uh to ask some questions uh, do we are we okay for that we got time for two or three questions um, okay great i would love to um give people in the audience a chance to ask questions uh any questions you may have it can be about best american comics or if you or just a fan of one of the artists uh, who are here and just want to ask, ask them some more particular question about their work or anything like that, we'd be happy uh, to hear what you might like to ask too. Would anyone like to ask a first question? All right. I'm, I'm curious, this is for everybody. Um, I'm curious if maybe this is just your, well, maybe it's for you specifically, Bill. Do you think you're, it seems like you have an interest in process that came through in this talk today. I feel like more maybe than than in previous volumes. I don't know. Is that a, is that an issue maybe for you, Ben, or is that something you think about in terms of the way the work is made? No, or I just the finished. I don't see the work being made. I just look at the finished product. But do you think there's and, something uh, about the the way that no. these artists make the work that separates it? Or yeah, well, really. definitely, but I don't see that happen. No, those are just questions Bill is asking them. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I, I look at the, I just see the finished surface and either it interested me or it didn't. But you know, they happen to be, make um, pictures that are interesting, drawings and r the writing. I mean, they do both in, in an interesting way. And th that's their process. But somebody could follow their process and come up with terrible things too. So I, I think a process is like the, like a dry cleaning process. I, it's nothing. It's just it's what you what you make out of it, right? I mean, everybody comes up with an idea. They sit down. They make sketches, and they uh, do water. I mean, they, everybody does comics the same same kind of range of techniques. I don't know anybody. Uh, I mean, I thought of like that guy in the book who did those panels, paints with um, with like a modeling, color, the color used to paint models, that enamel. I mean, that's pretty uh, unusual. But I didn't. That's not why I like them. I like them because of the stories and the images. And, yeah. It's not a performing art. It's like we finish it, and then you see this thing. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I don't know. No, it, that sounds like I, I'm trying, you know, trying to, like some bad, fine art person who's into talking about their process. Who cares? How they, it's completely, I don't care if they stole it from somebody or <laughs> cut it out of a magazine. I don't really know. Right. And I don't know anything about most, this is a very misleading uh, sampling because these are all people in New York. Mm -hmm. who, some of them I know. I don't know any of these people. I didn't even know their names. Mm -hmm. Basic. Sometimes I had no idea what their name was. So hardly. Uh, but uh, yeah, not their uh, process. No, I didn't. I don't know. Anyway, that's true. I mean, they're they're probably, and I think actually this. Um, uh, speaks to sort of the broad and interesting um, view that Ben took in this volume is that I think there are probably more uh, artists who I had never heard of before this past year in this volume than probably in the other ones that I've worked on. It really like cast a wide net and brought in some, you know, unexpected things. So, I mean, yeah, there, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of people, like, as you say, it is a little unrepresentative yeah. in the fact that we have four people from New York. I had not never met Ellie before, but 
you know, Kim and Josh and Gabrielle, of course, I've met before. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we could, you know, with yeah. uh, with a travel budget, we could have assembled a real uh, panel of strangers. You know? yeah. yeah, this is, I think, the, like the tenth year of this series, right? This is the first one was two thousand six, so, so it's the twelfth volume. Well, yeah. 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 So the thing is, that was twelve years ago. So say another ten years before that, comics maybe got some academic recognition or cultural recognition, and um, you know, the danger of all that is that it becomes this academic form, mm -hmm. uh, like poetry and fiction, and people think they can have a career doing comics. Mm -hmm. Like in the 50s, people thought they could write poetry. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, when I was growing up, you, that was not a career choice to be a, a cartoonist. You were either a painter or a, a writer. And comics were in this, like, a suit. You know, a no man's land for career-wise. I don't know. It'd be a low-level kind of uh, popular art. Um, so that's the, the um, people are looking at models now. Or what a co good comic strip is, or what an acclaimed comic is, and trying to replicate it. And is you know, it's not actually academic. Uh, no one's teaching them to copy. You know, these acclaimed comics are just looking at it and doing it, and uh, that's a kind of a danger. I mean, there's more, I can't believe how many comics. I, there <laughs> must have been, I think there must be a million people making alternative comics now. Well, in the world, maybe in America, a few hundred thousand. But it's um, an enormous, uh, like how many people were writing poetry and you know had a novel in their bedroom closet in the, uh, so, um, yeah, so the the people who stood out for me may have been, been approaching comics in some different way, but I but I mean I yeah, but um, that's uh, or some of them predated the uh, cultural acceptance of comics, so they didn't even have the choice. Uh, so anyway, but that's where it is. It's ten. It's six, twelve years into this kind of a book, which is amazing. I mean, so uh, it, is it a canon? I don't know. If you put look at all those books, I, I don't know what it, I haven't really compared them all. Um, or what my taste is in, in those books. Probably uh, not for me, but anyway. I'm time for one or two more. If anybody wants to raise your hand, I'll do my best to bring you a microphone. Uh, I know you all like dove really like deep into like the like indie scene of like just like people publishing like random book like people publishing like random like comic books that they just made on their free time like and uh like putting in this like best american comics books like thing so like you can like showcase it to like the world uh i wanted to know if like you've ever like like looked into like more commercial work to like yeah. put into these put into this because i was just like i was just wondering like uh like not to say these books are like terrible or anything, but like, like there's like some really good like stuff in like commercial work. I was just, just wondering that. Are you talking? You're talking more about like a Marvel or DC type comic or something like yeah, that? Yeah, not just like those like image or, or image like or dark horse. Say like like mm -hmm. French like companies or like Japanese companies well the book is limited to North American work so it has that, that was word. a big problem right that's yeah big... okay I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really think that through no, it's okay well, but uh, no it's a good right. question though um, yeah the book uh, I mean it's like I'm not even you know many of the words on the on the in the title are kind of in contention it's like the best okay uh, American actually it's North American so it includes Canada and Mexico uh, and then comics well what the heck is it, or comics anyway. I mean, we've got some work in it that sort of pushes against those boundaries. 
Um, and then the year 2017, well, it's a work from 2000, September 2015 to August 2016. So, you know, um, anyway, there, you know, there's a, there are a lot of footnotes uh, on that title. But anyway, but to your question, we have, a, um, we have dipped into that world a little bit. We've had some uh, work from Image and Dark Horse and some of those companies in the past. Not a lot, to be honest with you. One of the big problems is that there are um, some issues sometimes when you're dealing with companies that manage characters that have massive sort of trademark value uh, in terms of getting permission to reprint the work because it's part, that's part of it. But I would say a big part of it is the fact that this is part of um, a broader range of series like, you know, that sort of grew out of Best American Short Stories. And Best American Short Stories is really talking about language as literature, you know, kind of the individual voice making prose fiction in the short story form in a way that's like really uh, engaged with using the form of language and the form of short story in their own personal individualized way to communicate you know their own personal you know idea you know uh, fictional idea or whatever so you know it is a kind of you know high art uh, type of project and uh, you know not that i really want to respect those kind of high low boundaries but I, I think the way I look at it is, you know, we want people, we want to showcase work that's as engaged with the comics form as the literature in Best American Short Stories is engaged with the literary form. And we want to run work that's as individualistic in the comics form as that work is in the literary form. Now, sometimes things do come through those more, you know, commercial collaborative projects that do have a strong individual point of view, a very, very strong visual style. Um, and, you know, we do, I do, I go to Forbidden Planet almost every week, just looking to make sure I didn't miss anything like that. And sometimes that stuff does get in there. At the same time, there is this whole other world that isn't always well represented um, in a, a, a kind of more typical comic book store of you know people who are engaged with the idea of what can you do with putting images together what can you do with mixing text and image and who are um, very strongly engaged with those questions because they have something really individualistic whether it's fictional or non-fictional or something in between uh, or just purely aesthetic that they want to get down on paper that they can only do using that form so that's, I think that, you know, diff different people do that in different ways, you know. I mean, I think all the people on this panel, including Ben, do that. And the result is something totally different. I mean, you know, Ben's work is a universal way from, you know, Gabrielle's work, which is a universal way from Josh's work and, you know, on down the line. But I think everyone here, for example, is really engaged with that project of what does it mean to mix, you know, images together and, and have text in that to and get that down on paper and then you know process you know what medium am i using and how am i printing this etc all those questions because there's um there's some something that you want to communicate and, and you're developing and refining your own personal individual voice uh so that you can do something that's simultaneously more and more you but also more and more clear to the person who's reading it and that's i think a lifelong project um, yeah, mo I think most of the work uh, in this book is uh, by people who were um, purposely uh, trying to offer a corrective to uh, either the comics they grew up with or commer the idea of ma making comics in a uh, assembly line or a commercial, whatever that is, you have to make a lot of them for them to be commercial or they have to fit a certain mold. So all these people rejected that. I mean, it's not part of the same history. That history goes on, you know, from uh, at least the modern American comic books. I don't know, wherever you want to go back to. Yeah, there were always people who rejected what seemed like the solution. Here's how you make a commercial, good commercial comic. And yeah, we rejected it, I think. Maybe we couldn't help it, or we couldn't make them. We physically couldn't make them for some reason. I don't know. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I mean... I looked at a lot of uh, um, science fiction and event. Yeah. yeah. I went to, uh, I think there was some we looked at. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, there are a few things in that area we looked at. Actually, Josh, I, I have an image I didn't show. You've been make you've worked. I don't know are, are, if you're still. Um, if you have more, do you have more titles than the all time yeah. comics coming out? Yeah, you've worked. been working on a series that, in a way, is kind of a tribute to that work that you grew up with uh, as a kid, right? Yeah. I would guess, right? Do you want to explain what all time comics is? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, this is like a. Uh, Project it is based on um, it's based on uh, the impression that 1970s and 80s comics left on me, and I think a, a big a big thing and when you do any kind of um, art or art is what uh, it's just important it's as important what you don't do as it is what you do do. So um, rejecting when I go to a modern comic book store and I look at the superhero titles, the colors are really out of control. And so we went back to trying to uh, uh, have the um, color, the feeling of the colors that were being done in uh, 1970s comics especially. And there's also been some kind of, some artists will do sort of a retro thing where they make the paper faux, faux yellowed, faux weathered. And we didn't want to do that either, but we didn't want it to look, we didn't want to have the crisp computerized coloring and we didn't want to have the fake faux thing so um, we've ended up doing something which is right down the middle we found paper which was like a version of newsprint so the color ages it it, it sinks into it in a certain way and uh, yeah so it ended up being something that I had an opportunity to um, to try to see if I could do genre comics and combine the talents of uh, people who are from more of you know this this community, the independent or alternative comics community, and then see if I could get what would it be like if I had them collaborate with people who are who are from who are veterans of the mainstream comics. So we had uh, Herb Trimpey. He did the last thing he ever drew. Uh, I think, for us. He passed away like a year after he finished the art. Yeah, yeah. And we got uh, Al Milgram, who people are sort of divided on, um, but I love him. I love I love Al's work. And he... For, uh, for people who don't know, like Herb Trimpey was, oh, had yeah. an extremely long run drawing The Incredible Hulk, is what I remember him as, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. His career's fascinating on a lot of different levels. He's You he saw... You can watch the trajectory of a, somebody who's sort of an A-list Marvel guy and then slowly slides into the 70s when he's kind of being thrown the B-level stuff and uh, then the 80s Saint, where that transition goes even further and then the 90s where he's struggling to hang on to work. I became really fascinated that after Herb was let go from Marvel in 95, 94, Maybe earlier, he was only in his fifties, and he uh, he he published his diaries that you can Google if you Google New Yorker magazine Herb Trimpey. He there's these really intense diaries are incredibly personal about uh, the process over the f a few years of watching the work disappear and then getting all these signals from the new bosses at Marvel that he didn't have a future and then finally getting, letting the ax fall and then, you know, admitting incredibly personal things like that he was having panic attacks and that he didn't know what his future was going to, what it was going to be about. And that just struck such a chord with me. Um, so when I had a chance, and then I saw that he was still doing work, I wasn't sure what it was going to be like, and I managed to reach out to him. Apparently, he had just started to entertain the idea of doing work again. Um, I think it had to do with uh, he had a he had he had a new marriage, and his wife was kind of encouraging him to get back into it. But he was he had been completely willing to turn his back on it. He started a new career. He was a vet, so he um, he went back to school in the some kind of vet, some kind of benefits and got a teaching degree and started being a, a teacher in Queens, not even an, an art teacher. So he went through this full cycle where he transformed himself. And um, that's the that's the thing with comics. It's like you work on them and your life seeps away as as you're making them and you you can go back and like Noah Van Skyver interviewed Peter Baggy recently and one of his best questions he asked him was, Do you remember when you look at an old comic, do you remember where you were at when you made it? And there's a sort of an idea of like, all of us can 
pick up a comic and say, oh, I remember what city I was in. I remember what the room smelled like that I did this comic in. So they're uh, both stories that you do for other people to read, and they're also things that have a, there's a lot of different layers to them, I guess. I'm not sure exactly how to articulate that. Well, yeah, it's kind of like you were saying about the 2010 piece. In a way, it's not its not a diary like Gabrielle's comic is a diary, but it kind of is, too, in a way. I mean, it's maybe to you in a way that it isn't for anyone else, but you look at it, and it's a play, it's somewhere in your artistic development. You were talking about how it was like, well, I, you know, you made that at a time where you were trying to do, like, outrageous ideas or certain kinds of images on paper or whatever. Um, but it's also like you look at it and it's like, oh, I was in this time and place. I mean, that's in the addendum at the back of the comic that's reprinted in the Best American Comics volume. Yeah, maybe viewers can kind of see that if they read in between the lines with anybody's work that they follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for coming out and thank you to Bill and Ben for putting this together. Thank you. And thanks to Gabrielle, Josh, uh, Kim, and Ellie for being here.